Come on, how are we this morning? Good, 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 good. Well, man, we are so excited to be with you this morning. We want to bring a word of something that just has been laid on our hearts, and we really feel like the Lord um, wants to speak to you this morning. And so as we are getting ready, and we'll unpack just in a second what we're about to dig into, but Ryan, last night I was laying my Bible, I was setting out my stuff for this morning, and he was like, you're bringing your big Bible to church? And I was like, you bet I'm bringing my big Bible to church, because we're going to dig into the Word today. Yes. And Vima, we are a church that loves the Word of God, loves reading the Word of God, and so why not just jump into the Word of God this morning, yeah, okay? Right. So we are going to be in John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It says, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, for it is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you are going there again? Skipping to verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Church, let's pray. God, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your guidance. And I just ask, God, that you would just guide my words this morning, that you would open our hearts to what you have for us in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So a little story about Ryan and I. We got married pretty young. We're 21, 22. I'm a cougar. Yes. Ryan was just finishing up college. I had just graduated. I was starting grad school. And like a lot of young married couples, we kind of had this like mental bucket list of things we wanted to do before we had kids. So, you know, you start checking those off and yay, you know, the fun married years. And But the whole time in the back of my head, I was thinking and praying like, God, when you want us to have a family, like put that in our heart. Like, put that in our heart. Hmm. So around year three of marriage, we were like, okay. We started talking, like, should we start on this journey to have a family? What would that look like? And so right as when we said yes to what we felt like the Lord was calling us to, we started this uphill battle. And if you guys know Ryan and I, we are very impatient people. Yeah. So one thing led to another, led to some waiting, led to doctor's appointments, and it was frustrating. And this past November, Ryan was at a conference for work, and one of his friends, um, he ran into one of his friends, and, and this friend, he has a spiritual gift that when he feels like the Lord is laying something on his heart, if it concerns you, like he wants to tell you about it. And so he walks up to Ryan one evening, he goes, hey, congrats, Papa. And Ryan was like, Papa, that's not my name, like that's my dad's name, why you call me Papa? <laughs> like I have two dogs. And he was like, you and your wife, you're pregnant, congratulations. And Ryan was like, that's news to me. So he calls me that evening and he tells me about what happens. And I was like, well, that's a surprise to me too. And so we got off the phone. I took a test and sure enough, we were pregnant. We were so excited. We, the, this long road, we are finally like, okay, thank you, God. And we went about a month before we got our first sonogram and we went into that sonogram and we soon learned that we lost our child, that we had had a miscarriage. And in those moments, I, we were crushed, number one, but in those moments, I felt so broken. I thought the one thing, Lord, that you call the, our women bodies to do, I couldn't even do. We were anxious. We were fearful. I was honestly doubting God. And I had never experienced grief in the way that I would feel it, like a wave crashing up against me in the days and weeks and months to come. And I'm telling you this, because I think we all have a dead thing, something that we've been crying out to God for, and we feel like 
there, there's just this vacancy on this other side that we're not hearing anything in return. Maybe for you, it's a chronic or terminal illness that you feel hopeless with, the doctors have no answers for you. Maybe for others, it's financial insecurity, or you're stuck in a job, or you're drudging through school, and you feel like it's never gonna end, and God has something better, but you have no idea what, and you're stuck. Maybe for some of you, you feel lonely. You feel like you don't have any community, that no one understands you, and you don't understand why. Maybe for others, you feel spiritually dead. Or maybe you have a friend or a family member that's that way, and it kills you, but you don't know what to do, and you feel stuck. You see, we all have a Lazarus. We all have something that's dead in our lives, whether it was then, whether it's now, whether it's going to come. It's just the way that life is. And I think as Christians, we've developed this equation that faith in God is going to equal some type of outcome. So we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we wait, and we hear nothing in return. But the good news is we're going to read. Is it Lazarus in this story? His name does not mean the dead man. It means the one who God helps. Isn't that encouraging, church? That's good. And so before we dig in to chapter 11, I just want to set the scene so you have a better idea kind of what's going on up to this point. So we're introduced to three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and they're sending word to their friend Jesus that their brother Lazarus is ill. So this is not the first time that they're sending help. We can see it says there in scripture, the one you love is sick. A couple verses later, it says Jesus loved these siblings. You see, they had been doing life together. They knew each other. This was not the first time. And so they're calling out to their friend who they believe is the son of God. Yet he was in a town that was about two miles away. And he stayed exactly there. He just almost been stoned in that town. He fled to this other town with his disciples, and there he stayed. And we learn at the end of verse, end of that passage, that Lazarus actually died. And so today, church, I want to talk to you guys about what do we do in the waiting period? What do we do in that time? So what is God teaching us? And so the first one is that God is glorified through our trials. So verse 3 it tells us. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But Jesus heard it and he said, the illness does not lead to death for it is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. You see here, Jesus wasn't phased by the news that Lazarus was sick. He already knew and even though the sickness was leading to physical death, Jesus was not going to let this lead to final death. You see, death in biblical sense leads to the separation from God. But yet we see here in verse 4, it says, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. God had a plan. And the beauty in our situations is that God sees us. He knows what you're going through. He's unfazed by it. Why? Because he created you. He knows you. He knows the anxiousness. He knows the loneliness. He knows the despair. He knows the hopelessness. He knows you. And he doesn't necessarily cause our trials or cause our pain or inflict that on us, but he does allow us to walk through that. And I think in these moments, it's important to know that these trials aren't meant to destroy us, but to strengthen our faith. Whether you're a Christian or maybe you've heard friends that are Christians say when they're going through a hard time, they may have a friend that says, hey, you just need to pray more. You just need to seek some godly counsel. You just need to go to church more. And yeah, those things are all good and we should do those things. But you can have great faith and still wonder. You can have great faith and still question. You can have great faith and still cry out to God. In fact, God wants you to cry out to him. He created you. He is your father. That's okay. God can be glorified even when you don't feel it. I think that's important to remember. So what else is God teaching us in this waiting season? Number two is that God's timing is not our timing. You know, we read this 
scripture we see in verse, let's see, verse 5, how it says, Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And honestly, when I read this from my own flesh, at first I think, well, Jesus is going to get there. Like, obviously they don't have the technology that we had. They, you know, used their little, I don't know, Pony Express, got him the letter. And I think their initial response or initial thought was that, okay, we're going to send this to him and he'll be here. He's going to know what to do. He's going to take care of our brother. And I think we do the same thing. When we're hurting, when we're in pain, Jesus, heal me. God, help me. God, deliver me. God, take this away from me. And yet, we may not hear something right away. You know, I think as babies, when we think about babies, when they're learning how to walk, and so they get up on their legs, and they kind of look like they're on stilts, and they start walking, and then they start gaining momentum, and then they fall. And what do they do? They cry. They holler. They scream. They do something because they know they're going to get the attention of their parents, and their parents are going to come over and help them up. And so I think it's easy as our God, who's our Heavenly Father, that we think the exact same thing, right? Yet we see here that God's time is not our timing. We see this here in this scripture, but we also see that in our own lives. And we see that again and again in scripture. Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, it took 25 years for the fulfillment of God's promise that they'd have a son. Sarah was 90 years old before she gave birth. I can't imagine being 90 and giving birth. Can you? Noah, who built the ark, you know, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. There was actually water on the earth for over a year. Guys, that's a long time to be on a boat. We think about the Israelites, God's chosen people. He told them, and he did. He delivered them from slavery and was taking them to the promised land. But because of their disobedience, on a, a trail with the mileage that should have taken days, it took 40 years but he still delivered them. He still brought them through. And the God of the universe, he even had a waiting period. His son was dead for three days. He could have chosen to, you know, make do, get things done, but no, he waited too because his timing is better than our own. There's purpose in the waiting. So what else is God teaching us? Do not lose sight that Jesus loves you. And he loves you, and he loves you. He loves all of us. When Ryan and I were getting married, we did some premarital counseling. And a lot of you guys have probably done this too, or you've heard of it. But we did the love languages test. And, you know, being naive, I thought, oh, we're, we're a lot alike. I'm sure we have the same love languages. So you take this test, and it tells you how best you like to be loved. And so we took it, and then we were, like, conversing about what we got. And Ryan was like, well, my love languages are physical touch and quality time. I'm like, well, that makes sense. And mine were words of affirmation and acts of service. Guys, those are completely different. And to me, if I come home and Ryan has done the dishes and he's folded the laundry and he's vacuumed all of our chocolate labs hair off of our giant rug in the living room, that makes me feel so loved. Like, whoo, I feel loved. Ryan could give two whatever about it. You know, he doesn't care. That does not make him feel loved. And God's love language is trust. God loves to be trusted. And so we see here back in verse 5 again. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So in verse 6, in the beginning of that verse, I don't want to miss out on the significance of that word, so. It's a two-letter word, and it's so simple, but yet it explains the whole reason why Jesus waited. It was because he loved those siblings. He loved them so much that he was willing to do something for them that was going to change their trajectory. You know, I think a lot of times when we're maybe like preteen or teenagers, and you're like, hey, mom, dad, like, can I stay out till one? And they're like, no. And you're like, why not? And they're like, well, because I'm telling you, just trust me. And in the time, like meantime, like that sucks to hear. You're like, well, that's dumb. Like, why can't I stay out till one? But yet there are parents and they know what's best for us. 
And the same is true with our Heavenly Father. He knows you. He loves you. He knows what's best for you. And sometimes it's waiting. You know, sometimes God's love means delayed answers to some of our most pressing prayer requests. We see this in this story, and I think we can honestly say we've probably seen it in our own lives. We can't interpret this perception of delay as a lack of God's love for us. You know, I think you can think back maybe to like a high school crush or something, and, and you're really sad it didn't work out, and you're like, oh, they were going to be my forever. And then you get 10 years down the road, and you're like, thank the Lord that didn't work out, right? Like, thank God for God's timing, you know, and, and that's a silly example, but we can see it in something simple as that, and I think it gets hard when then we get into the hard and the grittiness of life, and then things seem all out of proportion, but we got to remember that, that God knows best. And church, it's really important to not let your Lazarus convince you that Jesus does not love you, okay? Do not let that dead thing convince you that he does not love you, because he does, so going back to our, our season um, of sorrow and physical death and, and walking through that at the end of last year, we started praying through that time. God, would you heal my body? God, would you allow us to have another child? God, would you take away this anxiety, this fear? God, forgive us for doubting you. And slowly but surely, moment by moment, he started to heal our hearts. And in April, we found out that we are again expecting, and we're super duper excited for what the Lord has for us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. But two, when I look back on what the Lord allowed us to walk through, if I wouldn't have walked through that, I wouldn't have gained this seat at a table with women who had also been going through infertility. I wouldn't have gained the opportunity to talk to them, to pray for them, to understand what they were going through. If I hadn't walked through that grief, I wouldn't have known about two months later when one of our college girls passed away how to walk through grief with so many other students. And in those moments, the Lord taught me how to trust him deeper and deeper. And Ryan can tell you, I don't trust easy. Trusting is hard for me, for humans, for God. And I'm constantly working on that. But yet, it's basically like he took the window, a fogged window, and he just started kind of washing away some of that fogginess. And I just want to encourage you guys, as you think about that hard season, that hard time, whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, whatever's to come, I just want to encourage you. Are you trusting him in that? The Lord tells us that there's joy in the morning. Do not give up. He loves you. He cares for you. Trust him. It's worth it. Come on, give her a hand, give her a hand, let's go. Hey, praise God that we have women in our church that are preaching, that are leading, that are teaching, that love the word of God. Come on, amen, right? Come on, praise God. That's good. That's really good. Great job, great job. Hey, I want to pick up right where we left off. She mentioned we're a church that loves the word of God, and so are you guys okay if we read a bunch of scripture this morning or what? Come on, are you ready? Let's go. We're going to jump in. We're going to go verse 17. We're going to pick up. It says this. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Say four days. Four days. Four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Hmm. It's important to note it's important to note that the common Jewish tradition of this time was that the spirit could return to a dead person within three days. Three days. See, by the time that Jesus had gotten to the tomb, by the time he had gotten to Lazarus, it had been four days, right? Lazarus' time had expired. It was the common Jewish tradition 
for the soul to re-enter the body within three days. I want to start off by asking you a question. What's your reality? What's your reality? Some of you would say, hey, Ryan, I'm a realist. I'm a realist. What it looks like is what it is. That wouldn't have gotten you very far in this passage. That's the end of that. I thought he'd be here by now. I thought Jesus would be here when I needed him the most. Everyone in here has a Lazarus. Everyone in here has something in their life that has made them question their faith. Madison talked about the equation, the equation that faith in God equals some type of outcome. The Lazarus effect has debunked that equation. What is God teaching us in this story, in this part of the passage? Number one is that God's job is outcome. Our job is process. God's job is outcome. Our job is process. See, don't praise God for what he does, but praise God for who he is. Amen? Amen. How many times in our life do we praise God for what he does, but not who he is? All we can do is sow seed. See, God is the God of the outcome. Our job is to sow seed. You know, we all know the farming example. A farmer tills up their land, they plant the seed, they water it. That's what they're in charge of. But see, the farmer, the farmer is not in charge of the weather. All the farmers in the house say amen for this year, 110 degrees, no rain. They're not in charge of the climate. They're not in charge of how much rain that they get. All they're in charge of is, is sowing the seed. What does sowing seed in our life look like? In our daily walk with Jesus, what does sowing seed look like? It looks like community. It looks like worship. It looks like prayer, solitude, Sabbath, fasting, loving others, giving generously. That's sowing seed. God's the Lord of the harvest. Harvest represents the result, the outcome. The seed is just the process. See, we decide what we sow, but are you ready? We're not always in charge of the outcome. And for many of us, that sucks. That's hard. Why? Because we like control, right? We like our comfort. We like being in charge. We like the, what's, what's in the future. We like knowing the outcome, the future. Giving up control is hard. Let's keep going. Picking up in verse 23, going to 31, it says this, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Verse 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and she went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Verse 31, when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Number two, God cares about our life on earth. God cares about our life on earth. See, in verses 23 and 25, right, Jesus has something much more immediate in mind. The opportunity here comes for Jesus to deliver one of his great lines in the Bible, right? One of those lines that give Christians a lot of faith and boldness in the, in the, in the, in the face of fear, but see, Jesus is not only saying that he has power over death, although that is true, amen? amen? He's saying that he's the resurrection and the life. To believe in Jesus is to live. And see, life in the Bible 
conveys the fullness of life. It's the fullest sense of the Bible and, the, and used here in John does not simply mean to exist. Life does not simply mean to exist. It conveys the fullness of life, one which we were made and we can experience in Christ. And that life begins when we become Christian. And though we continue to live physically and will certainly die physically, our life is now hidden with Christ and God. You know, all the way back in Joshua, all the way back in the Old Testament, God led the Israelites out of the wilderness and into Canaan. In our Christian life, we are brought out of sin so that we might be brought into abundant life. The wilderness is never God's intended destination for us. It's not. But so many of us in our Christian walk, we're in the desert and the spiritual dryness of life. The wilderness is never his intended destination. She knew her scripture, verse 24. That's Daniel 12. She's quoting Daniel 12. I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day, right? Daniel 12, it talks about the end times. It talks about him coming and rising again. That's what she thinks he's talking about. But see, God wants to see you impact your friends. God wants you to experience joy. God wants you to be delivered from depression. God wants you to enjoy company. God wants you to have fun experiences with family and friends. Why? Why does God want this? Because it reflects him. It reflects him. It brings others to him. Our life on this earth matters. Our life begins when we become Christian, not when we go to heaven. What's the point here? What's the point of this section of the passage? The point is, he's saying it's not just about the end result. <laughs> See, I have something for you on this side too. It's not just about the outcome. It's, just, it's not just about the end goal. See, she thought he was talking about being with him in eternity. He says, I'm so much more than that. I'm so much more than that. It's not about what he does, but who he is. See, you wanted me because of what I do instead of who I am. See, believes in me in this passage translates to trust in me. Trust in me. How many times in our life do we pray to God for what he does, but not who he is? I think that's easy for us to do. I feel like that's easy for us to do. Praying for specific things, hear me out. Praying for specific things is not bad at all. Praying for healing, praying for joy, praying for your children, praying for safe travels, those are all great things. But see, God is a relational God, not just a saving God. He wants to be in relationship with you. All right, how many of y'all have seen the movie Talladega Nights. Come on, slip up your hand, no shame, it's church, whatever, come on. Okay, right. Those of you that did not raise your hand, you gotta go home, you gotta watch it. I'm sorry, Pastor John, I'm telling him to watch a PG-13 movie. But here's the thing, go home, find the censored version, whatever, you gotta watch it. There's a portion in this movie that's hilarious, right? Ricky Bobby, he's the racer, the best NASCAR driver there is, and he has this partner in crime, Cal, right? And they're at this mansion, Ricky Bobby and his wife's mansion, and they're eating a scrumptious, amazing, fine meal of Domino's and Taco Bell. Mm. And they're breaking bread together, and they ask Ricky Bobby to say grace. And who's he pray to? He prays a sweet baby Christmas Jesus. <laughs> he likes that version of Jesus, right? He's going on and on about baby Jesus, but then the prayer takes five minutes, I kid you not, because him and Cal are just feeding off each other, going off. I'd like to think Jesus is a, something coming on a cloud with fire of angels. I'd like to think Jesus is this, boo, 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 and coming down with this. And they go back and forth, back and forth. And then finally, Ricky Bobby's wife interrupts very angrily, and she says, Ricky, would you just finish the dang prayer so you can win tomorrow? Finish the prayer so you can win tomorrow. How many times in our Christian life do we pray for what God does but not for who he is? How many times in our life 
Do we ask God, ask God when things are hard, when things are great, when we need to win a race, when we need to get that job, when we need to have this promotion? But we're not praying to who he is. We pray to him when we need him the most, like Ricky did in that race. I want to put verse 27 up here. What's her response? I love this. Her response says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know why my brother is still dead, but something inside of me says he is God and I am not and that I should trust him. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on in my life. I can't control this, but something inside of me says that he is God and that I should trust him. When my grandparents were first married, um, they they bought a farm, okay? And the way they bought this farm is my grandpa came home one day and said he bought a farm. (laughs) And my grandma says, I didn't know you wanted to farm, and well, they bought a farm, so that was his dream. But one thing you need to know about this farm is it's really special to my family. Right, lots of kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, cousins were raised on that farm. A lot of fun experiences, a lot of crazy four-wheeler stories, not from me, of course, from other people, but all kinds of fun experiences. And so they they were, my, my family loves this farm, they were raised on this farm. One thing you need to know about my grandpa is that he went to auctions a lot. He went to auctions about every Saturday. And he would go to this auction, and he'd always come home with something. But hear me out. He didn't come home with just little stuff, (laughs) right? He came home with more farming ground. He came home with more farming equipment. He came home with cattle. And I kid you not, y'all, one time he literally came home with real, live American bison, buffalo. My grandpa rolled up trailer of buffalo. He was known to leave and, and come back with all kinds of purchases. And every time he would drive away, my grandma in her head is thinking, oh my goodness, what's he gonna come home with today? How are we going to afford this? But see, she never questioned him. She never doubted him out loud. She never confronted him. She never argued with my grandpa. Why? Because he always provided. He never left them without anything. He never, he always provided food on the table. He always had our family's best interests in mind. So every time he left, she trusted him. She says, I don't know why you're buying those buffalo, but I trust you. I don't know why you're buying all that acreage, but you haven't failed us yet. So I trust you. I'm not going to question you. It always worked for the greater good of their family. Something inside Mary told her that he is God and that she should trust him. He hadn't failed me yet. Let's keep going. This story's getting juicy. We're getting to the best part. Are you ready? Verse 33, going all the way to 44. Here we go. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And in verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. And then some of them said, but couldn't he have just opened the eyes of the blind man? Also kept this man from dying. Last point. Oh, sorry, verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And then Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been in there four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. 
I tried to rush the last point without getting to the good stuff. Number three, joy and suffering can and should coexist. Joy and suffering can and absolutely should coexist. See, not only does God provide hope, not only does God provide healing, not only does God provide miracles like he did in this story, but this story also shows us that God is with us in disappointment as well. Yeah, Yeah, he provides hope. Yeah, he provides healing. Yeah, he provides joy and miracles. But man, he is with us in the thick of our disappointment, in the thick of our sadness. In verse 35, man, Jesus wept. This example shows heartfelt mourning. Heartfelt mourning in the face of death does not indicate lack of faith. Heartfelt mourning does not indicate lack of faith, but rather honest sorrow at the reality of suffering and death. Sadness does not mean lack of faith. You can be sad, you can be angry, you can cry out to the Lord and still have faith. I know I've said this when I've preached before, but I wanna say it again. Have you ever met somebody, have you ever met somebody who's going through everything? Maybe it was the loss of a loved one too soon. Maybe it was a tragedy, whatever it may be. But when you encounter them, when you speak with them, when you have a conversation with them, they have joy all over them. They have hope for a future. They have a promise. They're holding on to God's peace. Have you ever met somebody like that? How are you doing that? A few months ago, someone close to me lost their mother too soon, unexpectedly. And that was hard. But over the next few days and weeks, as I was with this individual and we were talking and having conversations almost every day, he had joy. He had peace. He had hope. He was holding on to a promise. After a few weeks, I... (laughs) came up to him weeping, crying. He said, how are you so joyful? How are you so peaceful? How are you still loving kids, taking them out to lunch, doing ministry, speaking to these great memories of your mom? It impacted my faith, y'all. The way he lived with joy and suffering impacted my life. Joy and suffering can coexist. When we went through that miscarriage, man, I was angry. I cried out to God several times. But something inside of me had joy. Something inside of me had peace. Something inside of me was holding on to a hope for our future, for our kids' future, for our family. I had joy in the midst of suffering. See, his delay will set up a bigger ministry moment in your life. His delay in your life will set up a bigger ministry impact in your life. See, Bible time. Have you ever heard the term Bible time? See, we always don't see Bible time. Why? Because God does not operate off of earthly time. He doesn't. Look at Abraham's life. It took nearly 500 earthly years for a promise to be, to be fulfilled, right? 430 years of slavery in Egypt, 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. But in Bible time, God delivered his promise by noon. After all of that, God still delivered his promise. Reset your clock, don't give up. His timing's not our timing like Madison mentioned. In verse 36 and 37, there's two voices here. See how he loved him. But then the doubts, the why, the crying out to God. Could not he just open his eyes and raise him from the dead? There's one voice in our life that's saying, hey, he loves me so much. And then the other one is saying, why? Why, God? See, you don't always get Lazarus back. But Jesus always brings something forward. 
You don't always get Lazarus back. Lazarus doesn't raise from the dead every single day. But Jesus always brings something forward. Faith, purpose, impact, maturity. You don't get this dead thing back sometimes, but he always brings something forward. Don't let your Lazarus convince you that God doesn't love you. Don't do it. How you respond to the disappointment in your life shows whether it'll be faith that propels you or fear that paralyzes you. Faith that propels you, what does that look like? Being vulnerable and saying, God, you are still good despite my circumstances. God, I'm going to share my story even though this story is not what I had written, even though this story is not what I had planned, Man, that takes faith. <laughs> that takes faith. And fear is not from our God. Fear is from the enemy. Faith that propels you or fear that keeps you back here, paralyzes you. Last year, I was at a high school camp for four straight weeks. I got to share my story, my testimony of God delivering me from an illness, God delivering me from depression, God saving my life, following Jesus. And at the end of the week, I had a high school student come up to me and approach me weeping, and he said, hey, Ryan, can I share you my story, and then can you pray for me? So over the next few moments, I got to hear his story, and we got to pray together. And we went on our way out of circumstance, right, out of randomness, this year we were back at camp just hanging out and guess who comes up to me? The same guy, he had graduated. This time he had six students with him. And he said, hey Ryan, I just want you to know, because of your vulnerability, because of your testimony, it impacted my faith enough that I said yes to Jesus for the first time. I followed Jesus for the first time. And then he said, it impacted me so much that this year I wanted to come back and I wanted to lead my high school friends. And that's why these six guys are with me. Would you share your story with them? I went and shared with them and then I, I prayed for them and I kid you not, y'all, four out of the six, the last day raised their hand and said, I wanna follow Jesus. Come on now, that's good stuff, right? Now hear me out. It is not about me, absolutely not, but God used that story for his glory. It's not about me, it's about Jesus. You know, I wanna, I wanna say when Maddie and I went through this miscarriage, it was hard, but Maddie's sitting at a table with other women who have lost babies, Maddie's sharing her story with others, praying for others. And it's not what we had planned, but it was for his glory. It impacted others. I want to end with this, verse 44. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Take a look at that screen. One thing I want you to know is this. John does not record Lazarus' reaction or the aftermath of his raising. Except for we know that many people, many Jews believed in God after seeing this miracle. Here's what I want to end with. The focus is on Jesus, not Lazarus. The focus is on Jesus, not Lazarus. The focus is on Jesus, not your pain and suffering. The focus is on Jesus, not our will, not our victories. The focus is on Jesus. And just like many people believed when Daniel was delivered from the lion's den, many people believed as a result of seeing this miracle of Lazarus raising from the dead, and many people will believe as a result of your story too as a result of you sharing your story, as a result of you being vulnerable, it's gonna impact all kinds of people. The focus is on Jesus. God wants to use you today. Don't let fear paralyze you. Let faith propel you. Here's what we're about to do. We're gonna sing 
one more song. And we all have the Lazarus effect in our life, right? We all have a Lazarus effect. We all have something in our life that is holding us back. We all have something in our life that is keeping us from moving forward. We all have something in our life that is causing us fear and anxiety and anger. Here's what I want you to do with that Lazarus effect. I want you to take it during this song, and I want you to lay it at the feet of Jesus.